superhero Well, we've talked about chilling crime sites of serial killers, kidnappers, terrorists, and crazy gunmen. How about we finish off with a mass killing of an entire cult? That's right, Waco. Texas is best known nationally for the 1993 siege of the Branch Davidian compound, the Mount Carmel Center. The Branch Davidians, in case you've forgotten, were a cult that were preparing for the end times, aren't they all? They were also involved in meth production, the illegal sale and possession of firearms and many other criminal activities. Their prophet, David Koresh, was being investigated for sexual abuse of both of age and minor women. So the ATF, FBI and Texas National Guard decided to conduct a little raid. The Davidians didn't like that so much, a two-month siege ensued and then, on April 19, 1993, the agencies converged on the compound. No one really knows what happened after that, but the whole place went up in flames and at the end of the assault, 82 people were dead. A lot of people blame the FBI for the disastrous assault, but, really, the cultists literally dug their own graves with their behavior. So we've heard about serial killers in Chicago and Milwaukee, how about we go visit another psycho in another Midwestern town? This time the venue is Cleveland and the place is Ariel Castro's home in a residential neighborhood of the city, 2207 Seymour Avenue, you ghouls. Castro is, of course, the seriously unhinged guy who thought it would be a great idea to kidnap three neighborhood women, two of them just teens, and keep them captive in his house. For over a decade, one of the women was finally able to escape and warn the police after Castro accidentally left a door unlocked. Before that, the three had been subjected to a terror regime by Castro that included rape, beatings and torture. What is certainly most chilling about this is that the woman who escaped did so with her six-year-old daughter. Castro was the father. This monster committed suicide after serving a month in prison. Apparently he couldn't take what he dished out. Big surprise. On the other hand, just about everybody shed a tear when former Beatle, rock and roll royalty and universally regarded icon John Lennon was killed outside his apartment building, the Dakota, in New York City on December 8, 1980. He was with his wife Yoko Ono at the time and had just signed a copy of his new album, The Excellent Double Fantasy, for his murderer earlier that evening. Mark David Chapman was the name of the murderer and, if you still want to be angry at him for murdering the greatest Beatle, be my guest I won't stop you. Chapman shot Lennon four times outside his home, then sat down and read a freaking book until the cops arrived. I don't know, it doesn't seem like he was particularly repentant, does it? Maybe that's why the guy is denied parole every time it comes up. Let's take a trip back a little bit further in time for this one, shall we? Lizzie Borden was, by all accounts, a fairly quiet gal in public. In private, it seems. She had a long-running feud going on with both her father and stepmother, primarily over money. We'll never know if that contributed to the violent murders of those two, or indeed, whether Lizzie was the murderess she was acquitted of all charges. But the fact is that on August 4, 1892, somebody in the Borden home in Fall River, Massachusetts, took an axe to both of them. Again, I ask you, what is up with all these summer murders? Moving on, just like OJ's case over a century later, Lizzie Borden's trial was a huge media circus. Everybody wanted to see, hear and read about the sweet, innocent girl who supposedly viciously murdered her parents with an axe. And just like O.J.'s trial, pretty much everybody seems to believe that she did it. If anybody remembers the full nursery school rhyme, Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax, you can skip to our final entry. Don't say I never gave you anything. This is another extraordinary incident which, like the O.J. murders, is notorious worldwide, perhaps even more so than those ones. I'm talking about the assassination of JFK, the President of the United States of America. 
Now, whether you believe all of the crazy conspiracy theories or not, the grassy knoll, the Zapruder film, the magic bullet and second shooter, etc., the fact of the matter is that one guy definitely shot JFK. That would be the infamous Lee Harvey Oswald, a sort of communist with a sad agenda. He shot the president from his hiding place on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building in downtown Dallas, Texas. I shouldn't have to tell you, everybody who was alive at the time knows where they were when they heard the news, but it happened on November 22, 1963 and has never, ever been forgotten. Oswald always said he was a patsy, giving credence to all of those conspiracy theories but all the evidence points to him alone. I'm fine with him taking the blame, as also, apparently, was Jack Ruby, who murdered him live on national TV.